Right. Hi, everyone. Welcome again to Author Story. I'm Alexander Lim, your host. And for this episode, I'm interviewing Stephen Campbell, author of the book, Making Your Mind Magnificent. And for those of you following along who are interested, you can go over now to the Amazon link in the description below the video and check out or get a copy of Stephen's book. So Stephen, welcome to Author Story. Thanks for being our guest. Thanks for so much for having me. This is going to be fun. Yeah. <laughs> so Stephen, uh, first off, can you please tell us a little bit about yourself and the book? What's your author story? Uh, well, my author story is actually the first 20 years I worked in hospitals, so I have a very strong background in, in physiology and I taught physiology. And then uh, after that, I got my master's in information systems hmm. uh, around 25 years ago and began uh, teaching courses actually in computers. Hmm. But my passion is the brain. And so hmm. I found myself over the years teaching courses to beginning students on how to study, how to uh, take exams, how to manage their time, etc. And I took what I've learned about the brain uh, into those courses. And at the last particular college where I, I taught, this, the, the president noticed that when students took my course, they wouldn't drop out. Mm -hmm. So during the years when I taught the course, the retention was like 93%, something outlandishly high for an American college. Right. Um, but I was not only teaching, I was also the, the educational dean. So I was, mm. I was in, in the evening, so I was gone from 8 morning to 10 night. So Mary, my wife, sat me down. She said, okay, <laughs> your dad died at 62 and you're 61 working 14 hours a day. If you right. die early, I'll kill you. Right. So I said, okay. So I retired, but this message that I've developed over the years um, based on the courses that I was teaching in college is so wonderful that I began going to... Uh, hospitals and and uh, retirement facilities and drug places and weight loss places and found that the message that I, I have which I'll share with you in a second is mm. so powerful that people loved it and before I know it people were saying where's your book where's your book where's your book well I've already okay. written a college of co couple of college textbooks but um, not a book like this but they kept saying where we have we have to have a book on this we have to be able to take it home and, and read it and you need to write it the same way you teach it because right. I I've, I've taught this to about over 32,000 people. Right. So um, I wrote the book, and it's now in its third printing. Mm. Um, I was the most surprised person in the world because I never, you know, sat down and said I'm going to write a book. But people love it. So the, and they keep buying it. They keep buying it for their family, for their daughters, for their husbands, for their friends because they said you got to write, read this book. It's mm. really powerful. Right. Cool. And so I guess that's how you became the uh, brain whisperer then. Yeah, yeah, that was really interesting. I needed a, a branding, and I'm not right. a psychologist. I don't have um, a degree in psychology, but I've been studying psychology for years and years and years, and I felt really kind of, you know, what right do I have? But as I traveled around America sharing this, this message, the message was so powerful, and psychologists would come to my seminars, and they would say, gosh, you're right on. You're, mm. you're exactly what we teach. And... Uh, so I wrote the book, and then I wrote the audio version of it, and, and the rest is history. So it's I was the most amazed person with this whole thing, because I wasn't expecting this. Cool. Fantastic. And of course, you've got all the success going going for you on right now. Yeah. Yeah. It's very... In fact, I'm speaking right now to this this evening at the at this Commonwealth Club of San Francisco, which is apparently the place where speakers come to speak. Nice. Former presidents and stuff like that. So I'm... I'm really blown away by how, how big this has become. Yeah, I mean, you're in good company right there if you're speaking at that convention. I mean, the yeah. club, yeah. So next to the book, Stephen, would you mind telling us a little bit more about about it and what it's all about? Sure. I'll give you, I'll give you a, a, a two-minute synopsis of its message because it's mm -hmm. really easy to do. Right now, Alex, while I'm talking to you, you're talking to yourself. Mm hmm in fact, you're talking to yourself thousands of times faster than I'm talking to you right now. Mm -hmm. And your brain can do that because when you talk to yourself, you use words. And, and when I talk to you, you use words. But mainly when we talk to ourselves, we use pictures and feelings. Mm -hmm. So when I think of Mary, my wife, I don't think of her with words. I think of how I feel about her. And I think how pretty she has become to me in the 46 years we've been married. And so... Mm -hmm. um, we really do talk to ourselves far faster than I am talking to you right now. But here's the important point, and this is the crux of the book. Mm. While you're talking to yourself, your brain is believing everything you tell it. 
mm-hmm. without question. Ew. Okay. That's really scary, All and right. it's really wonderful. The scary part is when you say, this is just too hard, I cannot do this. You know what your brain says? Your brain says, okay, and then it makes sure you can. That's its job. Hmm. That's the scary part. But the wonderful part is when you say, I can do this, the brain immediately says, okay, and then becomes obsessed with finding ways of doing it. Hmm. Now, big question, is what you're saying true? Your brain doesn't even care. And when I heard that in a psychology class years ago, I was really skeptical. And, and a book that I really recommend to people if they're rather skeptical of this is, is titled Phantoms in the Brain, mm-hmm. written by Dr. V.S. Ramachandran. Phantoms refer to phantom limbs that have been amputated. Mm-hmm. When a patient goes into a doctor's office, he'll say, you got to help me with my arm. I can't do a thing with it. And the doctor may have to say, well, that could be because I amputated that arm six months ago. Mm-hmm. And the patient says, you didn't tell my brain that. My brain doesn't know it's gone. My brain still thinks it's there. My brain wants to pick things up with it. And the brain gets it to be itchy and achy. And you got to help me with this thing. So the brain doesn't care whether what you're saying is true or not. Hmm. This really started with the work of Dr. Albert Ellis, who wrote a little book called A Guide to Rational Living back in 1961. Mm -hmm. That's how this whole thing started. And he's really one of the founders of cognitive psychology. And what he suggested, and we now know to be true, is that everything we can do today is primarily based on what we are saying to ourselves about ourselves today. Mm-hmm. To shorten that, we could say what we can do today is based on what we're believing today. Mm-hmm. Now, when he suggested this back in the early 60s, psychology had a conniption fit. They said, no, 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 no. You're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong. Okay. The way you are today <laughs> is because of unresolved childhood conflicts and your right. childhood. That, of course, was Freudianism. That was followed by behaviorism. That was Dr. B.F. Skinner out of Harvard University here in America. He said, no, no, no. The way you are today is because of cause and effect. It's it's all behaviorism. That was mm-hmm. followed by, it's all in your genes. That didn't last too long. That was followed by, it's in your environment, your mm-hmm. birth order, your culture, your mom, your dad, etc. And Dr. Ellis came back and he said, you know what? I think they're all true. Mm-hmm. How could they all be true? Because when you say it, and then you lock on to it, and then you make it the primary message in your mind, your brain's job is to make it true. Mm-hmm. That's called neuroplasticity. That was coined by a Dr. Eric Kandel in his wonderful book, In Search of Memory, back in the early 70s. Mm-hmm. And, I'm sorry, back in the, the first part of the century. And what Dr. <coughs> Ellis suggested is that what we are can do today is based on what we say to ourselves about ourselves today. The best way to explain that is to give you a little story that, that, that illustrates the point. Okay. For the first 42 years of my life, I said to myself, I'm really stupid in math. Mm-hmm. And guess what, Alex? I was really stupid in math. I okay. couldn't do numbers, but I discovered I'm really good with computers. I was one of the first computer geeks in the early 70s before the Apple came along. Right. And I began... Um, I love computers so much, I got a graduate degree in computer science, began <laughs> teaching computer courses. And one day the dean came to the office, he said, one of our math professors just is retiring next semester, so you are our new math professor. And okay. I just freaked out. I said, no, 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 I can't do numbers. He said, you want a job, you better learn, because you're teaching math next semester. Okay. So I ran down to the library and I picked up all the books could on brain based learning. This is back in the eighties, so this is before the internet came out. All right. And I, I began teaching my math course based on how the brain learns. And mm-hmm. this is how this whole thing started in the in the eighties. And students began saying to me, You're such a good math teacher. Okay. You're really good. You make it so easy and so nice. And the Dean King said came to me and he said, you're causing a problem because all the students say, I will only take math and Mr. Campbell teaches it. Okay. And what I did, Alex, is I began switching the messages I was giving myself. Mm -hmm. I began saying, wait a minute. If I'm so smart with computers, I got to be smart with math. Mm -hmm. And what did my brain say? Okay. Is it true? Don't care. Mm -hmm. All I care is what you tell me. Mm -hmm. But you lock onto it 
and you lock on to those messages, my job is to make you really smart in math. Now, it just so happens that my brain is wired for math, and I really am smart in math. In fact, I ended up writing two college textbooks nice. on what do you think? Computer software and math. Right. Okay. But for the first 42 years, I said, I'm really dumb, and my brain said, okay, my job is to make you dumb. Mm -hmm. So here's the message all in one sentence. If everything we can do today is primarily based on what we say to ourselves about ourselves today, we can change what we are saying to ourselves about ourselves when, Alex? Today. Mm -hmm. And what will our brain say? Okay. Is it true? Don't care. Mm -hmm. All I care is what you tell me. Interesting. And when I began sharing this message, I began seeing people's lives change. I started with the with retirement people, people who were older, mm -hmm. who would say to themselves things like, I'm just too old to do this. I've never been able to do it. This is really hard. And I taught them that when they said that, the brain said, okay, and my job is to make sure you can't. But by a very simple tweaking in what they said to themselves, by changing what they were saying to themselves, it was amazing the changes I saw in them and in their lives. Mm -hmm. And I could give you story after story after story, which I won't do because we don't, I don't think we have the time here, but there's a lot of testimonials on my website. So, right. So the, the, the message is, is, is wonderfully simple. The brain believes what you tell it. Mm -hmm. You change what you're saying and the brain will accept those changes without question. Mm -hmm. You lock on to what you're saying, you make them the primary focus of your life and the brain rewires itself so that those new messages become a part of the way you think and then over time a part of who you are. Mm. That's exciting. Wow. Wow. So that's sort of the, the message all in five minutes. Wow. Does that make sense? Yeah. I hope. It sure does. It sure does. <laughs> okay. So so what I'm getting here is that this is, um, I don't know, for lack of a better word, more uh, so, something like self-talk. So this is some, more something it's more. It's self-talk. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, it's self-talk. It's it's formally it's called cognitive psychology. Okay. It's simply saying that we are the way we think. Mm -hmm. We are what we say to ourselves. Right. So for forty-two years, I said I'm dumb in math, and my brain's job is to make me dumb in math. Mm -hmm. I switched that, and I said I'm really, really smart. The brain said, Yeah, you really are. Mm -hmm. And I began teaching it, and lo and behold, I discovered I really am. Mm -hmm. And that not only affects what we think about ourselves, it also affects how we feel about ourselves. Right. So I'm going back to the work of Dr. Albert Ellis, A Guide to Rational Living. What he also suggested is that the feelings that we have about ourselves, the feelings that we have about our life, do right. not come from what has happened to us. Mm -hmm. They don't come from how we were raised. They mm -hmm. don't come from things that we do. Mm -hmm. You know where they come from, Alex? They come from our beliefs about what's happened to us. Mm. They come from our beliefs about how we were raised. Mm -hmm. They come from our beliefs <coughs> about what we can do. Okay. And what Dr. <coughs> Ellis is suggesting, in fact, I have his book right here in front of me, is that you can change those beliefs. Mm -hmm. And your brain says, okay. Mm -hmm. And when you change those beliefs, the feelings about yourself follow. Mm -hmm. Now, he also suggested, and again, psychology had a conniption fit, that our feelings follow our beliefs up to that point, and psychology really began the earlier part of around 1879. Mm -hmm. Up to that point, psychologists felt that the feelings came first. So when 9-11 happened here in America and we watched the towers fell, right. we had instantaneous feelings, all mm -hmm. of us, all the world did, as we mm -hmm. watched the towers fall. But those feelings gradually over time changed based on what each one of us were believing about what we saw. Mm -hmm. So I'm not saying that feelings in, to, in the beginning come from what you're thinking. I mean, things happen and you instantly feel things. But over right. time, over time, they change 
based on what you are saying to yourself about what you're believing. Hmm. And so you can change those beliefs and the feelings follow. Right. So for the first 42 years of my life, I felt very bad about myself because I felt I was so stupid. Mm -hmm. Well, the reason I felt I was so stupid because that's what I was saying to myself. Mm -hmm. Then I switched that. And I said, wait a minute, I'm discovering in some areas I'm really, really smart. Right. My brain said, yeah, you really are. Why? Because my brain believes what, what I tell it. Mm -hmm. And as I locked onto that, I just got smarter and smarter and smarter in these other areas. And I found out in some areas I'm really great. In other areas I'm not. But boy, in these areas I really am. Right. And that's true for every single one of us. We all have natural gifts we all have something that we're naturally good at mm -hmm. and when we lock on to that and discover that it's amazing what the brain can do right unfortunately we pick things that we're not naturally good at and we just feel more and more frustrated mm -hmm. so what i tell the people is major in what you're good at major in your majors let someone else do the other stuff if you're not good at bookkeeping if you're not good at this or that let someone else do it for you mm -hmm. if you're not good at organizing which i'm not I'll let Mary do my organizing. All right. I'm an amazing speaker, so that's what I'll I'll specialize in. Hmm. Does that make sense? I hope. Yeah, I yeah, yeah. It's, yeah, uh, it's good. pretty good sense. So, Stephen, I mean, let's talk about the brain a little, because the brain is a physical construct. Yes. Is there anything in uh, like biological recent biological research or anything like that that uh, supports the psychological aspect of um, I don't know self talk? Absolutely. Let me share with you, first of all, how much the brain can 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 learn and grow and change. People say, you know, Steve, I'm older. I can't really change. It's really hard because, you know, my brain, I'm not, I'm not remembering things. Let's talk about how much the brain can grow first. Okay. Imagine that, well, when our, we have two daughters, Abby and Sarah, and Mary said to me 36 years ago, we got to see Sarah about the city because hmm. she was raised in Runner Park, a little tiny town here in America that no one's ever heard of mm -hmm. so she knew nothing about a city so let's imagine that I read her a book okay? Okay, okay I read her a book that book is recorded in the prefrontal cortex of her brain that's just under the forehead mm -hmm. in what is called a neural cluster a little teeny weeny cluster of neurons I read her another book the brain records another cluster of neurons for that other book mm -hmm. then we take her to San Francisco and Oakland and we show her some buildings some skyscrapers and some cars and the brain's recording all of these new images in terms of neural clusters. Mm -hmm. Then when Sarah goes to sleep that night, here's what her brain does. Her brain says, okay, now that you're asleep, I'm going to spend the next eight hours making sense out of all the stuff that you gave me during the day. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to do so by finding relationships between among all the things that you learned. Right. So here's a book about a city. Here's a book about a city. They've got people and cars and lights. There's no connection there. There should be a connection. So I'm going to create a connection, axons, dendrites, synaptic class, dopamine, between these two clusters of neurons. Mm -hmm. So what your brain's doing at night is just making connections between all the millions of stuff that you learn during the day. Mm -hmm. How many connections can the brain carry? Well, the connections are based on the number of neurons that you have. The latest study I've seen, the brain's got about 100 billion neurons. Wow. Each of those neurons are connected to an average of 10,000 other neurons. So the number of connections, which determines how many patterns your brain can carry, mm -hmm. is based on 100 billion to the power of 10,000. Wow. Okay. Yes. Wow. That's 100 billion times 100 billion times 100 billion, 10,000 times. Peter Anakin, one of the Russia's top neuroscientists, he was a student of Ivan Pavlov. Mm -hmm. Remember Pavlov's dog? Yeah, yeah. Okay, right, okay. He wanted to know, this is in the early 70s. This is back when they thought there were about 30 billion brain cells, if you've read literature, which I have. How do you write 30 billion to the power of 10,000 out in longhand? Mm -hmm. And he used a computer. He figured out to start with the number one, you follow it by 6.5 million miles of zeros. Mm -hmm. wow. So what we're discovering about the brain is that the primary element that holds us back from learning or growing or changing is not the brain, it's what we say to ourselves about ourselves. Our brain is virtually unlimited hmm. in terms of what it can learn hmm. and change and grow. 
and that's so exciting because people say to me so often I I just can't remember things and I forget things and yeah. what's wrong with me and there's something wrong and bad and of course the whole time they're giving them that they're they're giving themselves those messages and the brains agreeing right and so what I do is I say okay let's look at how much your brain can do mm-hmm. and how much you've learned and, and grown and changed and that gets them very very excited wow okay wow Cool. That, yeah. That's 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 huge right there. Oh, that it's is, huge. Yeah, yeah. And this is only this is this is relative. What people say, why didn't we? Te- why didn't they teach this to us forty years ago? So we didn't know this forty years ago. Mm. In 1969, there were four hundred members of the International Society for Neuroscience. The latest membership now is forty-two thousand. Mm-hmm. Because now we have the technology to watch the brain work while it's working. Mm-hmm. And so we can do these amazing brain studies and see what the brain's doing. And so if you don't keep up, things that you learned a month ago is old hat. You just have to continually read to see all the new discoveries that they're making. Right. And they're also very encouraging because we're just seeing how amazing the brain, the human brain, really, really is. Mm-hmm. This, this, this the brain, um, I mean, you, you brought up uh, something like, you know, like old people say, you know, I'm too old or something like yeah. that. Does the brain age or is it well, a state yes, of Well, yes, it constant? does. It, it, it ages because you have to realize that the brain's um, carrying trillions and trillions of patterns and it adds to those patterns with every day. Mm-hmm. So, yes, it does get physically smaller slightly, but in terms of, of getting old and uh, other than Alzheimer's and this sort of thing, the brain's amazing. The brain only takes up, this is interesting, Alex, the brain only takes up about 2% of your body weight, mm-hmm. okay? Yeah. That 2% uses up 20% of your energy. Mm-hmm. Your brain uses up more energy than your heaviest muscle, which is your gluteus, which is what you're sitting on right now. Yep. That 2% also uses up, that 2% of your brain also uses up 20% of your energy it uses up 20% of your air, 25% of your blood, 30% mm. of your water, and 40% of your nutrients all go to your brain. Wow. And you're talking about an organ that doesn't move. Mm-hmm. It doesn't move. It doesn't move like all the other parts of your body does. It doesn't move. All this is molecular chemical stuff. Right. So it's just, it's just processing information all the time. And what's so exciting is that the messages that it gives to us, we can change. We can say, okay, no, I'm not going to believe that anymore. Mm -hmm. And the brain says, okay, is what you're saying true? I don't even care. Mm -hmm. All I care is what you tell me. Wow. Wow. Cool. Fantastic. Right. Yeah. (laughs) That's definitely a way of looking at things. It is. It yeah. really is. And when I when I and I've, I've shared this with so many different audiences, and they all, they just love it. They say this is so cool because mm-hmm. we didn't know this. Yeah. When people say I'm just stuck this way, I've always been this way. You know what their brain says? Okay, you are, and you'll always be this way. Mm-hmm. Why? Mm-hmm. Because that's what you're saying. Right. For a number of years, I would do my seminars to DAC, the Drug Abuse Alternative Center for the County of Sonoma. It was a, it was a residential um, facility for drug addicts, and mm-hmm. I would go in every Thursday night and give my presentations. Right. And a man came up to me a number of years ago, a very, very, very big, scary-looking man, very, okay. tall, very tall, very big, very muscular. He was really angry at me. I won't tell you what he said because you'd have to take me off the air right. but he was really angry he said okay. mr campbell i'm really angry at you all of this is baloney and he didn't right. use the word baloney but just use your imagination right i said why is that rick and he said because i've been to all i've been to san quentin i've been to all the prisons i've right. been to all the institutions and okay. none of this works i've been through all these programs and first of all i'm dyslexic mm-hmm. so i can't really read uh, I was raised in a drug, drug culture. I was abused in ways you wouldn't believe. I'm mm-hmm. a damaged man, and all of this is baloney, and none of it's going to work. Mm-hmm. And I showed him a slide. I used PowerPoint in my presentations. I showed him a slide, and on the slide were simply names. Mm-hmm. The James were Alexander Graham Bell and mm-hmm. Jay Leno and Whoopi Goldberg and right. and, and Tom, Tom, Tom Cruise and, right. and, and all these amazing, amazing people. And I said, I said, Rick, all these people were dyslexic just like you mm-hmm. but they must have said at some point in their lives even though it's harder for me even though I 
have to do it this way and even though it's more challenging I can still do this I can still do that I can still do this mm-hmm. and then I looked up at Rick and I'm six foot so he's probably six foot four right. I looked up at Rick and I said Rick when you say this program will not work you're absolutely correct but the reason you're correct is because that's what you're saying mm-hmm. and your brain's job is to make sure that it doesn't work and I swear Alex I think I saw tears in his eyes and he said to me very quietly he said you mean it's really up to me and I said yes Al I guess Rick it really is it really is up to you and he finished the program and I was putting food in my car where we live one day and he came bursting out of the grocery store doors running right to me and this guy must have been 330 pounds so I was just okay I'm dead he's gonna kill me right and he picked me up put me down thank goodness and he said you know what I'm doing Mr. Campbell I said what are you doing Rick and he said I I went through the program which he did Mm -hmm. and he said I didn't tell you this part but I love I love numbers I love numbers I love Excel I love spreadsheets I can't do I can't do words but I can do numbers and they were throwing all these fruits and vegetables out and that just maybe have a conniption fit so I developed an Excel spreadsheet for them uh-huh, to help uh-huh. them keep track of all their stuff and it's really cut down what they're throwing away wow. they're thinking of automating it all and right. maybe using it at all the other stores yeah it started with Rick giving himself a different message mm. it started with him saying okay it's gonna be harder but I can still do this I can still do that and what did his brain say mm-hmm. okay is it true don't even care mm-hmm. all I care is what you tell me mm-hmm. Wow yeah and I could share with you so many stories about with the same sort of thing that's cool that's cool yeah. <laughs> all right. there's another story that I love to tell that that illustrates this whole thing all in one story okay sure go I ahead just, shoot is that right yeah go ahead shoot okay um, I used to teach I used to talk teach math at the University of San Francisco and mm-hmm. one day uh, after my first day of class a student came to my office she said Mr. Campbell I'm so glad you're my professor but I'm a C student in math I've never been able to get above a C and I'm a C student mm-hmm. and I said Sue well I used to be that way so let's work together so I worked with her and, and we got her some tutors and she got an A in the first midterm mm-hmm. I was so excited I gave her the test and she looked at it and she looked up at me Rick and she said <gasps> I'm sorry Alex and she said oh Mr. Campbell this is a mistake Mm -hmm. I said what do you mean Mm -hmm. Sue she said I've never gotten above a C on a math test you must have made a mistake right I said this isn't a mistake Sue this is a genuine A so then she looked at it longer and then she looked up at me and a big smile creased over her face and said oh do you know what this means and I said oh yes I do Sue but you tell me you tell me this means Mr. Campbell that when I flunk my next test I can still maintain my C okay (laughs) and I said Sue just get an A on every test she said oh I can't why because I'm a C student Mm. and you know Alex that's exactly what happened she flunked the next test she got a C in the course okay and I sat down with her. I said, Sue, answer me this. What would have happened if you would flunk this first test? Do you know what she said, Alex? Hmm. She said, easy. I would have said like crazy get an A on the next test. Okay. I said, Sue, just get an A in every test. She said, I can't. Mm-hmm. Why? Because I'm a C student. Mm-hmm. I'm too old. Mm -hmm. I've always been this way Mm -hmm. I can't make this change Mm -hmm. I can't remember anymore Mm -hmm. this is the way it is Mm -hmm. I'm stuck the way I am or or do you know when your old life ended Alex about one second ago Mm -hmm. it just ended your old life which means your new life began when about one second ago now do the math if you've got 60 seconds per minute and 60 minutes per hour and 24 hours per day in one 24 hour period you have 86,400 new opportunities for a new life mm-hmm. every single day in one year that makes up to more than 31 million all we have to do is take them mm-hmm. and the brain says okay wow that's exciting stuff as you can tell I get really excited about this oh yeah oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> cool 
Okay, so Steve, I mean, this is this is very this is very interesting. Um, in the last few minutes of the show, I mean, like you have a radio show, don't you? Yes, I do. It's on kows.fm. On just go to the to the internet, and I'm on at nine o'clock today, from nine to eleven every Wednesday morning. Hmm. Okay. Uh, what what uh, what's the uh, what's the station again? It's K O W S called Cows. We call okay. it Cows. K O W S dot F M. Oh, okay. All right. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. anyone out there is interested in listening in? Uh, you've got the uh, place and you've got the time. So feel free to check it out. <laughs> so, in closing, then the book is Making Your Mind Magnificent. Our, the author is our guest Stephen Campbell, and as you can tell, he's very passionate about this. <laughs> Uh, the website where you can get the book on is at stephenrcampbell.com. You can also find it on Amazon. So, Stephen, um, thank you a lot. Thank you very much for your time and for being on Author oh, thank Story. thank you for having me. It thank was you for fun. Me. Good. <laughs> cool. Thank you, Alex. You're welcome. So, if any of you listeners want to know more about how to have a magnificent mind, feel free to go ahead and get, well, rather buy since it's not for free, uh, making your mind magnificent, which you can do so right now by going to the Amazon link in the description below the video. And if you'd like to follow our author interviews on YouTube, I invite you to subscribe to our channel. So, bye for now everyone. I'll be back on Author Story next time with another inspiring author.